Hello and welcome everyone to the Dr. Susan Love Foundation Army of Women webinar series. My name is Crystal Hertz and I'm the research manager here today at the foundation. And today I have with me Manraj Kaur and Dr. Singaris, whom will be discussing their research on the psychometric properties of the new breast Q scales, breast reconstruction. So if at any point throughout the presentation you have any questions, you can use the handy dandy Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen. You can post questions there at any time throughout the presentation and uh, presenters will be answering questions at the end um, of the slideshow. So with that, I will go ahead and let our presenters kick off. So uh, the floor is all yours. Um, thank you, um, Crystal. Um, my colleague Elena Sangaris and I are very honored and grateful to be here today and to be presenting our team's work on the breast cue and how breast cue continues to advance clinical care and quality in breast cancer surgery. So, you know, in these times, social distancing is hard as it is. So Elena and I thought, let's not virtually distance and include our pictures so you can see who the people who are talking to you today. The picture on the right is Elena and left is me. We have both trained under the Breast Q leadership team for approximately a decade now. Um, and in our current roles, we continue to be mentored by Dr. Pusick and Dr. Klassen in the development, validation, and implementation of patient reported outcomes in breast cancer and several other health conditions. So with that, let's begin. As we know, most, if not all, of breast cancer treatments are focused on improving survival, which in past has meant putting less emphasis on the quality of life of a patient. However, as the diagnostic and treatment interventions have evolved over the past two decades or so, and mortality from breast cancer has significantly reduced, the patient's own evaluation of how they are doing both during treatment and in survivorship has come to the forefront. Breast cancer care has become patient-centered, which means that the quality of life, values, and preferences of patient have become important factors in treatment decision-making. So to provide best quality patient-centered care, we need to first understand what matters to patients and what aspects of quality of life are important, you know, be it participation at work, family life, social life, being able to continue with physical activity, for example, hobbies, or satisfaction with appearance. And not only do we need to understand what is important, we need to measure it. And the way to do that is by means of patient reported outcome measures or prompts for short. Here the term patient reported outcome means aspects of life that are only known by the individual and cannot be measured by means of any investigations, lab tests, you know, by physician looking at you or examining you. For example, pain is a patient reported outcome. The type and amount of pain an individual experiences can only be known by asking them directly. So patient reported outcome measures are in simple terms, a list of questions much like a survey that are developed to assess patient reported outcomes. As an example, the breast cue is a prom that was developed by our team to measure unique concerns of women who undergo breast cancer surgery. The development of breast cue started more than a decade ago. In fact, back in 2007, when Dr. Pusick, who is a breast oncoplastic surgeon with Dr. Klassen and Dr. Kano, who are both experts in health-related quality of life and its measurement, came together to address the need for a prom in breast cancer surgery. So essentially what we see here is a strong international collaboration between the clinical and the research sites of the world to carefully develop a rigorous prom that gives voice to patients in their own care. And this collaboration was not limited to clinicians and researchers. Patients, just like you, played a very important role. 
over 100 women participated in in-depth interviews that helped us understand what issues or aspects of life are important to women who are either seeking or have had breast cancer surgery. The interview data were used to develop questions and to ensure that the questions were clear and easy to understand. These questions were then organized into a set of scales, which formed the breast cue. The breast cue scales were then tested in over 1900 women with breast cancer to ensure that the scales were reliably measuring what they intended to measure before they were implemented in clinical practice. So now let's take a couple of minutes to understand um, the conceptual framework or the structure of the breast cue. The breast cue consists of procedure specific modules. This means that each type of breast cancer surgery has a list of scales, AKA modules, that assess the impact of that particular surgery. This is important because, you know, as we know, the impact of mastectomy alone and mastectomy followed by reconstruction, for example, can be very different uh, from one another. The breast cube modules consist of independently functioning scales. Now that can look like a very complex term. So let me break that down for you. A scale is a series of questions that all relate to one thing. So in breast cue, for example, these scales measure satisfaction with appearance, physical well-being, psychosocial well-being, sexual well-being, and satisfaction with care. The scores on these individual scales can fall anywhere between 0 to 100, where higher scores mean better satisfaction or um, better quality of life. The term independently functioning means um, that the scales are independent of each other. So the questions, for example, in satisfaction with breast scale will relate only to how satisfied women are with their breasts. This helps surgeon select the scale that is most relevant to their patient and only administer that scale. You know, as we can tell, this significantly reduces patient burden and provides the surgeon with targeted information. So I know you're what, you, what you are thinking. You're thinking, this looks great you know, amazing patient feedback, but what about the uptake of breast cue? Is it being used in clinical practice? And the answer is yes, yes, and yes. After the breast cue scales were developed, these scales were tested rigorously and tested some more in many different patient populations. Uh, this, this work spanned for many years and lots of patient and surgeon input was taken to make sure that they were as rigorous as they could be. In fact, at the time breast cue was developed, it was one of the few PROMs that were developed using extensive patient input, and it paved the way for how PROMs should be developed in the future. So it was not surprising, but very encouraging to us that the uptake of breast cue has been massive and worldwide. Um, it has been translated um, into over 40 languages, and over 100,000 women globally have completed the breast cue to date. Over 350 research articles have been published using the breast cube. So as an example, a group of breast surgeons in the UK conducted a review. So review basically means they looked at all the papers, scientific papers that have been published using breast cube from 2009 to 2018. This study looked at a couple different things, but mainly they were asking the question, how effective is breast cube as a prompt for breast cancer surgery? and they found that it is. They concluded that the breast cue captures patients' experience after breast cancer surgery in a meaningful way. It gives patients a seat at the table when treatment decisions are being made. So it is this massive global uptake, patient-led development, and testing of the breast cue that make it the gold standard prom for breast cancer surgery today. And our team members are not the only ones who deserve credit for it. We share that credit with you, um, Dr. Susan Love's Foundation and the Army of Women. Your positive and dynamic collaboration over the years has made it possible for us to gather a large amount of data in a short amount of time. This evidence has been used to enhance clinical care and research, and we could not be more grateful know that women diagnosed with breast cancer 
around the globe have a voice in clinical care and treatment decision making by means of rescue because of your contributions. As an example, we put out a call to the Army of Women to complete rescue in 2008 and 7,600 women responded, which was 82% of the Army of Women membership at that time. What is incredible about this is that women were at an average of seven years after surgery. This allowed us to assess the impact of treatment outcomes in long term, you know, many, many years after surgery, something that very few studies have been able to do. We used this data to do a couple different things, but let me highlight two examples here. We were able to assess how women feel about their breast cancer surgery in short term, mid term, and long term. The results of this paper helped surgeons understand what women should expect seven to eight years after breast surgery and what quality of life looks like in the long term. This information could then be used by surgeons to counsel patients, set realistic expectations before the surgery, and ultimately helping patients, giving them the power to choose treatments that are driven by evidence. The breast scales were also completed by a lot of women who had no history of breast cancer. The army of women data from these women was used to establish what we call population norms. Population norm essentially is a fancy scientific term for reference data. So this reference data allows the surgeons to compare the profiles of women who have had breast cancer surgery to women who have not had surgery. This is so important to do. This evidence helps surgeons, researchers, and patients identify the burden of undergoing different types of breast cancer surgery in the long term. So, you know, these are only two examples and a very brief introduction into um, our team's joint efforts, international efforts to ensure breast Q captures what matters to patients in a rigorous manner. But it does beg the question, are we done? Have we filled all the gaps in our understanding of quality of life impact of breast cancer surgery on women? Well, you guessed it. The answer is no. New prompts are needed as new areas and new concepts of quality of life are identified. Treatments continue to evolve. So the measurement of patient reported outcomes must evolve in parallel. To do that, the breast cure team continues to engage tirelessly with patient partners and clinicians to identify gaps in measurement of patient outcomes in breast cancer surgery. And so with that, I will hand it over to my colleague, Elena, who will highlight with an example, our team's efforts to ensure breast cure remains relevant and comprehensive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manraj. So I'll, I will now walk you through an example of the breast use sensation module that we recently developed with our Army of Women members. I will begin by setting the context for this work. So for the past decade or so, women undergoing a mastectomy procedure were left with debilitating loss of sensation to their breast, and there were no treatment options for restoring this sensation. Reconstruction techniques following a mastectomy were traditionally focused on restoring um, the size and the shape of the breast and how to make them look as normal as possible. However, there was no concept of making them feel as they did before. Surgeons are now realizing that issues such as numbness and tingling are major complaints from patients. So in recent advancements in reconstruction techniques, um, have been developed to restore sensation to the breast after mastectomy. And as Manraj has me had mentioned earlier, as treatments advance, we require new ways to measure their impact on patients. Currently, the breast cue does not consist of scales to measure breast sensation. And for this reason, our team set out to develop the new scales. So uh, development of the breast cue sensation module was completed in two phases. In the first phase, we conducted interviews with women who had breast surgery and data from these interviews was used to generate questions and to form our scales. 
We then showed the new scales to women and surgeons to ensure that the questions were easy to understand and relevant to the patients. This brings us to phase two. The goal of phase two is to, term, to, to determine which questions are most effective in assess, assessing sensation and if the scales are in fact measuring what we want them to measure. This requires a large number of patients and is therefore the phase at which we, can, we contact Army of Women members to participate. Now, before I summarize the results of the Army of Women study, I wanted to walk you through some examples of how we came up with the questions in phase one. So uh, we conducted 50 interviews with women across Canada and the United States, and the women varied in terms of their age, stage of breast cancer, and type of breast, breast cancer surgery. And they, belong, they also belong to different educational and ethnic backgrounds. This diversity allowed us to capture a variety of patient perspectives. So as an example of how the interview data was used to generate questions and form scales, here is a quote from a female um, who is 57 years of age, had stage one breast cancer and underwent a deep flat reconstruction post mastectomy. So what she stated in the interview was, it can be anything from a sharp stabbing pain to just an annoying ache to two nights in a row, it was this deep itch and there's nothing you can do about it. So what we try to do with each interview is to pull out important concepts that, that capture um, sensation and we develop items. So a, an example item from this quote is um, sharp pain in your breast area. As another example, this is a 50 year old woman with stage zero breast cancer and also underwent a deep flap reconstruction. So she states, I feel there is still a bit of heaviness. There are certain areas that are hard. One of the main things after the surgery was the weight and the hardness of the whole breast because I felt like I was going around with a bowling ball on my chest. I felt very heavy. So an example item stemming from this quote was, heavy feeling in your breast area. Finally, and um, this is a 42 year old woman with stage one breast cancer and an implant based reconstruction. And she stated, I think it was a lot more painful than I had anticipated. I was uncomfortable and the expanders were uncomfortable. There was a burning sensation that I remember from the implants. So yeah, just more painful, like when you wake up and try to move around and do stuff. So an example item that had stemmed from this uh, quote was burning sensation in your breast area. Now, um, we stop interviewing participants once we stop hearing um, new things from the interviews. So the data is then compiled and analyzed and categorized into different groups and these make up our scales and our conceptual framework. So for the sensation module we develop three scales that measure return of sensation, impact of sensation on quality of life, and abnormal sensation. Once the scales are formed and the conceptual framework is finalized we move into phase two. As mentioned above, we require a large and representative sample of women to complete the scales. And we are incredibly grateful to our collaboration with the Army of Women, as over 1,200 women contributed data uh, for the, to the development of the sensation scales. And here are a few details about their um, demographic characteristics. So their age ranged between 29 to 90 years, and the average was 58. Most women had both breasts affected with cancer and most had undergone an implant-based reconstruction. Now the results from the phase two study are analyzed using a method called rash measurement theory analysis. What this method allows us to do is to polish the scales and to order the questions from easy to hard, resembling a ruler. As an example, this is our return of breast sensation scale. The response options begin with, I have no feeling, and they move through to a more positive response, which is, I have complete feeling. If you look at the question, the first question asks, how much feeling do you have if you massage your breast area deeply? This question is one that women are more likely to respond to more positively and is therefore considered an easy question. As opposed to the last question, how much feeling do you have if your breast area is touched sexually? Women are less likely to respond positively to this question and it is therefore considered a harder question and is located at the end of the scale. So just as another example, uh, this is 
uh, what the output looks like from our analysis and how we determine the order of the items. Uh, so as you can see, um, the colors and the numbers represent the five response options in our scale. Um, so for the first item, you can see that most patients are reporting that they have complete feeling. And as you move down the scale, you can see more and more women are saying that they have no feeling as they respond to the items. So this is how we uh, determine the order and it's based on how women respond to the questions. We also use the data from phase two to determine any additional tests that are needed um, to remove items and also to ensure that the scales are measuring exactly what they, we want them to be measuring. But I will not go into too much detail about the other analysis at this stage. Um, so now that the scales have been developed, it is important for us to promote their uptake and use to inform and advance patient care. I'm sure you are all wondering, how are these scales used to inform and advance our care? For one, they can be used in research, and um, in research we can understand the short and long-term impact that treatment may have on patients and their quality of life. Second, they can be used in clinical care uh, by your surgeon to inform how you are doing, determine next steps in your care, and also if any additional treatments are, e are needed. Also, if you complete the survey before you visit your surgeon, um, this will improve your conversations this conversation during your encounter as um, they will have already seen your responses and have had an idea of how you're doing before you enter the room. Thirdly, and most importantly, compiled data from women can be used to better understand patient outcomes of treatment and also to better inform you and other women and as well as to set expectations of care and treatment. Now, in the interest of time, we provided you with only one example, but in our recent collaboration with the Army of Women, we've developed several other modules and scales of the breast queue with over 1,700 participants who provided data. And at this stage, we wanted to uh, express our extreme gratitude toward the Army of Women and its members. We are truly grateful, grateful for your support and look forward to our continued collaboration. We hope that you enjoyed our presentation. Please visit our team's website and Twitter feed to learn more about our collaborative research efforts. Thank you very much. Great, well, thank you so much for a great presentation. And to the audience, I again wanted to remind you that if you have any questions that you would like to pose to our presenters today, you can use the Q&A function on the bottom toolbar um, of, your, of your Zoom. So it's right there and it says Q&A and it looks like two little dialogue boxes. So go ahead and put your questions in there and we will uh, do the best we can to, to get to all of those questions. Um, so for the presenters, I'll open up with a question if you don't mind. Um, so you had um, mentioned that um, just how science progresses, so should our measurement skills. Um, and I was wondering, how can patients and advocates be sure that their provider is giving them the most up-to-date questionnaire? What are, or maybe what are some strategies that um, advocates and patients can, can use to ensure that? Um, so I'll start, um, Elena, and then you can feel free to jump in um, when you think it's appropriate. Um, so that's a great question, and I think that is certainly something that we want um, patients and patient advocates to be aware of. Um, our team um, has been very involved with um, patient advocates and patient partners, so we are hoping, um, you know, it is um, the it snowballs into more patient advocates and more patient partners becoming aware of how these measures are keeping up, how, how breast cue is keeping up with the um, evolving treatments. Um, but the onus also falls on the providers um, to ensure that they are using the most recent versions or the most appropriate um, skills for their patients. Um, and, you know, we hope that clinicians act responsibility and uh, responsibility and Again, like as I said, our team continues to engage with 
uh, patient partners, but we are also very engaged with the clinicians. So um, just to give you a very small example, Dr. Pusik, who is um, the core team member of the rescue development team, um, is in um, has several leadership roles at Harvard Medical School and beyond. Um, she's the ex-president of um, or the past president of um, American Society of Plastic Surgeons. Um, our team engages with the clinicians um, and researchers at several conferences um, you know, throughout the year. So we hope that um, you know, the word gets out. Um, we certainly are you know, doing our best and we ramp up efforts, um, especially when you know, new scales like these come into the picture. Um, but I think that's a, that that's a shared responsibility between researchers, clinicians, um, and patient advocates. I don't know, Elena, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, yeah, I agree completely with all that you said. I also, um, so there are several groups around the world that are starting to develop standard sets. So there's sets that should be used globally um, by individuals and they're pre, uh, they look through them and they decide on which, are, which questionnaires are best suited. So um, we're hoping that as we move into that direction that people will be using uh, the most suitable questionnaires and people will know what questionnaires to use because it is also very difficult to select a questionnaire uh, for your clinical care. Great, thank you. So we do have some audience questions coming in. Um, and so I will start with addressing uh, Terry Snow's question of, why didn't you evaluate lumpectomy sentinel lymph node surgery outcomes? Um, so uh, we did evaluate uh, those outcomes and we are continuing to gather more and more data. Not only our team, but teams around the world are collecting data um, in terms of different types of breast cancer um, treatments. This uh, specific presentation was geared towards um, new skills that have been developed or added to the BreastQ uh, portfolio. Um, so we limited these to you know, the most recent skills. Um, but as I mentioned, there is like a breast conserving surgery module that targets uh, lumpectomy um, and we have mastectomy module um, that includes physical well-being questions, targets, um, you know, chest uh, in reconstruction module, we have uh, scales that target fun physical function of the, or physical well-being related to abdomen um, or implant. We have scales that assess the impact of radiation. So this is just a very, you know, half an hour sneak peek into um, almost a decade um, decades work. So for Terry, my recommendation would be um, please follow us on our website that you can see on your screen. Um, and there you'll find um, the list of uh, skills um, and the studies that have been done um, using breast Q, breast conserving surgery or lumpectomy specific skills. Great, thank you. And also for attendees, if we don't get to your question um, or if you're scrambling to find a pen, don't worry, we will be uh, reposting this webinar as well. So you will have a chance to get that information um, at a later period of time. So we have another question here of how many questions are in the breast queue and how long does it normally take a patient to complete it? Um, so the breast cue scales are independently functioning and they range anywhere between 10 and some maybe 15 questions in each scale, but you won't necessarily be asked to complete all of the scales at once. Um, as Manraj had mentioned in her presentation um, that you could, clinicians can pick and choose which ones are meaningful to them and which ones will provide them the information that they need based on the patient's um, current state. And um, so, if you were to complete, let's say, the whole breast cue reconstruction module, it, it usually takes patients about 20 minutes or so, but that um, is not the case in a clinical setting as people are generally choosing uh, which scales to distribute. And um, I would like to add to um, Elena's answer that when we are, um, you know, when we reach out to Army of Women to complete these skills, um, more often than not, like in this case, we were testing which questions were actually capturing 
meaningful change effectively. So what may end up happening is the final scale may have eight questions, let's say, but we are asking you to complete 12 questions. And those four questions that don't make it to the final um, scale are questions that we find are you know, either very difficult to understand for majority of the participants, are not showing difference, because what you really want these scales to do um, is show difference between you know, your before surgery to after surgery outcomes um, and outcomes over a period of time. Um, and when we find that those are not the right questions, we take them out. And then again, it's followed by more testing and then more testing to make sure that the final version is complete, easy to understand, only has relevant questions um, and includes you know, things that are meaningful um, to the patient populations that are being targeted through those scales. Um, so yeah, so sometimes when the scales are completed by the patients who are members of Army of Women, um, they may see longer versions, but it's not always, um, you know, not all questions end up in the final survey. And that's why, as Edna mentioned, we need a huge sample um, of patients to be completing these scales at the testing phase um, so that we get a nice variety of, you know, different age groups, different um, educational background, different socioeconomic status, different types of surgery, different time points um, after surgery. Um, and that's why, you know, we've been so lucky to have Army of Women on our side. Okay, well, um, we have another question coming through, this one from Diane Head Headstian. Uh, regarding reconstruction, have you done any research on nipple rebuilding satisfaction over the short and especially long term? This seems to be a great unmet need. Uh, yes. So the nipple sparing mastectomy scale was part of the um, first and second round of um, Army of Women that we, we did a call in March and again in December, I believe. Um, and it was part of that scale. We're still developing because the population is smaller for that group. So we are still developing the scale, but it is coming and we hope that it'll highlight some more, um, more about the impact that this has on women. Um, and then we have another question. Have you done any evaluation of how much patients know about the various types of reconstructions before they make their decision? I feel that a big problem is that surgery Surgeons only share their procedures that they are trained to do. This is why what we do is so important. Uh, we hope we we also um, have uh, satisfaction with information scales as part of the breast queue, and we hope that through this information we'll be able to highlight where there are knowledge gaps to patients and where people are not understanding what they're getting themselves into. And that's why as we continue to build our portfolio and understand um, how patients are doing as we build our numbers, um, then we can better inform patients during a clinical encounter as to this is the type of surgery, this is what to expect, this is what an implant procedure might result in, this is what women like you have experienced, and it, it's plausible that you might experience the same. So as we increase our numbers, we'll definitely be able to be, we'll be more confident in how we address the patient in the clinical setting. And we'll be able to provide them with some examples of other women who have gone through this already and how their experience was. Great, thank you. So we have another one coming through. This question is, I am an occupational therapist and treat lymphedema. Where can I get copies of the breast cue to use in my outpatient clinic? Um, that is an excellent question, and we love that it is coming from an occupational therapist. Um, what we would recommend is uh, you can go to um, our Q portfolio website and there you'll find the email address for our team. Um, so reach out for us and then somebody from our leadership team will get back to you um, and then work with you in terms of what your specific needs are and what your patient population looks like. Um, and we'll be able to take it from there. Great, thank you. Um, and I think you may have an answered this one um, early on, but how many, um, how many different scales are there in total? Or I believe you're calling them modules. There are the sub different subscales. 
So there's three modules, one for breast conserving therapy and lumpectomy, okay. one for reconstruction, and one for mastectomy only. And of course, this now we're in our pre re recent call, we developed the lymphedema module. So we are continuing to build um, on this and the sensation module as well. So um, it's continuing to build, but as it stands, and with the new scales, we have five modules and then different scales within that measure, just different aspects. Here's an interesting one. How do you educate breast surgeons about using these scales? And do you have any idea of about how many um, are actively using these scales with their patients? How common of a practice is it? Um, that is an excellent question. So in terms, I'll answer the second part first, and then I'll answer the first part. So in terms of how are we tracking um, how, many are, how many clinicians or surgeons are actively using them with their patients? Um, so breast cue scales are available at no charge for clinical and research purposes. Um, and what that means is that um, the surgeons can contact our team at qportfolio.org and then um, we are able to share the scales with them and this is how we track how many are using and then we ask them questions around you know um, what purposes are you going to use the scale for and um, track their usage um, so that is how we know how many surgeons are using it of course um, there are surgeons in the community that we don't know about um, but this is one way that we are monitoring them. And how do we educate breast surgeons? So um, as I mentioned before, our leadership is very engaged with the surgical community um, and through various talks, um, you know, um, presentation at conferences, um, actively engaging on social media. So we have a very active Twitter feed. Um, we try and connect with as many clinicians as possible or as many surgeons as possible and try and disseminate the information on breast cue. Um, in terms of educating breast surgeons, um, our leadership team also um, gives a lot of presentations to various uh, surgical trainees. A lot of surgical trainees are engaged with um, various process uh, processes of development of the um, breast cue. Um, and we are hoping this is the way we can engage with them actively. So it's very active engagement. It's not, you know, um, a course per se, uh, but we educate them by engaging with them and keeping them engaged throughout the process. Um, I don't know if Elena, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, no, that's exactly it. And also, um, it's interesting you asked this question because this is a really important question right now in the field. And um, a lot of people are developing systems to also facilitate the collection and use of these um, prompts into clinical care. So it is a, a very important question and we are definitely moving in that direction as it, people are very interested in implementing these into their care. So it is a, a movement that we are still uh, moving towards um, and we've not reached our end point as yet, but um, definitely people are starting to use these scales. And Dr. Pusick is an example at her previous role at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, she implemented um, the breast cue in clinical care and it's actively used and they've collected data on thousands of patients. Great. Um, and then actually, I think you um, kind of addressed this one, but, but um, I'll, I'll ask it more. This one's a little bit more direct. Um, I'm a breast surgical CNS. Are there a list of academic centers presently using the breast cube? I'm not sure specifically. Um, I'm not sure how to answer that question, unfortunately. I'm not sure if Manraj, you're more aware. Um, I'm sure there is a list of academic centers that is being tracked um, through the Q portfolio team. Um, we just don't have that information handy right now. Uh, but if if you are interested, like please reach out to us um, and we'll get that information to you. Um, and then um, well, I'll give one more uh, question. Um, do you ever ask or look to join specific Facebook groups and other chat platforms in order to see where patients feel the needs are in terms of measurement? I'm thinking of a very active Facebook group 
um, on breast cancer reconstruction information and support. Um, that is, um, a, you know, something that has been done by um, other PROM developers. We have not used Facebook specifically um, or gathered data from chat platforms to develop our scales. Um, instead, what we um, believe is in like having conversations with participants, right? Conversations with patients. Um, some of our interviews with patients can be up to two hours long, where we really get in depth, rich data on um, the impact that um, the treatments have had on their quality of life, um, what their experiences of uh, uh, with the surgeons and the clinical staff has been, um, and what they think should be assessed. So we really work very hard um, with our patient population. Um, it, it's not by the means of Facebook groups, but it is um, by means of, you know, um, interviewing several women. And so as I showed for BreastQ, we interviewed initially when BreastQ was developed, we interviewed over 100 women. And to develop the new scales that we presented today, we interviewed over 50 women. So, you know, um, if you take into account all the interviews that have been done, uh, we've gathered substantial amount of data to, um, to understand where the measurement needs are um, and the impact of treatment is. And I'd also like to highlight that we do um, have a strong international collaboration that we always try to include women internationally as well, so that we can hear the different perspectives of women from different countries and different cultures. Um, so that's another important aspect that we try to tie into our qualitative sample. And also just to give you some context, um, quality, for qualitative interviews, they think that, um, it's we, they say that up to 20 interviews could give you the amount of data that you need, but we always try to go beyond that and interview more women. And um, also the inclusion of the international sample requires more interviews to make sure that they're as comprehensive as possible. And I would like to then add to that is for development of the sensation module and the scales that you saw in today's presentation, we interviewed across three different centers, two in Canada and one in the United States. And most of the um, rescue scales that are developed by our team um, then get tested in several different countries. So not only we are interviewing, but we are when we develop these scales, we are also thinking if you know the questions would translate um, into other languages and we, you know, there are teams internationally that are in fact translating rescue and then testing it. So um, it is really like widespread. So we do make sure that our scales are applicable globally. Great. And then I think we have time for one last one. Um, so has there been any research um, that you know of the effect of urgency on making these decisions um, and how maybe urgency impacts the responses to these questions? Um, sorry, can you repeat that question? Sure. Um, has there been any research into the impact, um, the effect of urgency on making this big, on making kind of a breast reconstruction decisions? So impacts of maybe stress or feeling like they have to make that decision with urgency impacting those results. Hmm. Um. I'm not, our team has not specifically uh, focused on that area. It's a very interesting area. Um, I'm not, I'm not 100% familiar with research around that area, but I'm not sure if Manraj, um, Dr. Puzik might also be on the line um, who might know more about the research involved. Um, but I would like to add that although um, it is not an area that we've looked at specifically, BreastQ does have psychosocial well-being scales. Um, and those are the scales that are intended to um, measure, you know, the emotional well-being um, and the social well-being of individuals. So completing these before breast reconstruction and tracking patients after breast reconstructions does give us um, a sense or does give the surgeons a sense of, you know, have if there was any distress or anxiety or, you know, um, any feelings of not feeling emotionally healthy before the surgery. Um, and again, to reiterate, like, you know, completing these skills then gives the surgeon the information that patient is probably at not ease in terms of their breast recon decision. And hopefully what we would like to see is that 
then building into the patient provider conversation and then the provider be it surgeon or anybody else then addressing that need um, in terms of you know either providing more information on the surgery or referring the patient to additional um, either patient groups or additional healthcare providers. Um, so I think our psychosocial skills kind of get at that, um, but not in a direct way. Okay, great. Well, thank you. And I just wanted to remind our remaining audience that um, more information can be found at qportfolio.org or online at q underscore portfolio. Leo. And I want to thank you um, again to the presenters for coming and uh, sharing with us the results of, of your very interesting study. We greatly appreciate it. And to our audience members, if you value uh, this, type of, um, this type of research as well as this type of webinar, please visit us at the Dr. Susan Love Foundation.org. Um, we are always looking for new partners as well as your support in continuing this kind of this work, this kind of research work. So again, thank you so much. And um, so I think that'll be all for the end of today. So thank you so much to our presenters. Thank you. Thank you very much.